Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Michelle Batty, and I'm the manager of the Eurogen uh, web, um, network. Um, just before we get started, I'd like to take a couple of minutes uh, to introduce a little bit about what the European reference networks are. So Eurogen is one of 24 ERNs, uh, European reference networks, which were created by the European Commission in 2017, and they cover most medical fields. And Eurogen uh, is highly specialised surgeons who cover rare urogenital uh, diseases and complex conditions that need highly specialised surgery. So we're talking about things where the expertise is very rare, really. And we are a network of 57 healthcare providers in 20 member states. Some of our activities, well, well, we do virtual consultations using a secure IT platform provided by the European Commission, um, which allows us to conduct um, virtual cross-border MDT uh, discussions um, to diagnose and suggest treatment or surgical approaches. And uh, this is a fully secure system called the Clinical Patient Management System. We also collaborate with training and education activities. We have a clinical exchange program. We have this webinar program. And we also have a patient registry, which is uh, just being rolled out now. And that will be very important for the future uh, to try and collect data um, and surgical outcomes and quality of life uh, information about patients with rare diseases and complex conditions. Um, so this is part of our colorectal uh, series of webinars, which we uh, produce in association with Ernica, another ERN, EUPSA, and the Anorectal Malformation Network Consortium. And this evening's webinar is about uh, the long-term follow-up of anorectal malformations, which we know is a very complicated area. And we're delighted to have with us uh, um, four presenters this evening. We have uh, Sabine Sanaki and Cecile Cretol from the Department of Pediatric Surgery at the Hospital uh, Necker Enfant Malade in Paris. We also have uh, Hanika Eiselstein and Irene Schocker, I hope I uh, pronounced those correctly, uh, from the Department of Pediatric Surgery at Erasmus MC, Sophia Children's Hospital in Rotterdam. Uh, so thank you very much to our four presenters this evening, and we're really delighted to have you here with us to share your expertise on the long-term follow-up of anorectal malformations. Uh, thank you very much. Sabine, you have the floor. So hello everybody, it's a real pleasure today to introduce you uh, Celia Cretol, uh, a colleague I'm working with since uh, more than 20 years now and uh, who is uh, now leading uh, our uh, reference center on anorectal malformation. We will uh, share with you our vision of uh, the long-term uh, follow-up and also management of anorectal mal malformation and try to uh, to, to focus on our uh, qu the question uh, that seems very important to us is how to make it more relevant. Let's start with a clinical case. Just to show you um, what we are trying to improve and long-term follow-up of these patients in a coordinated and multidisciplinary care pathway. Uh, our aim is to teach patients and families to the best practices to give them autonomy in daily care and in their future life. And this is this clinical case is very representative of what could be a multidisciplinary follow-up. So this is a female uh, with a claucal uh, malformation with a short common channel. Uh, she was operated on day eight. Uh, uh, high mini and two ovaries were uh, diagnosed at this moment and at two months of age she underwent a right nephrectomy for a cystic dysplastic kidney and a left anti reflux procedure and uh, she was on uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for five years uh, and presented uh, urinary leaks 
with hypertonic bladder uh, that lead to uh, give her oxybutynin. She presented also numerous uh, urinary tract infection. When she was 12 years old, uh, there was a diagnosis of ureteral remnant, right side of the urethra, under the sphincter. And uh, there was an attempt to close this uh, fistula by a transvaginal and a transuretral approach. Uh, she was then uh, okay for three years, but uh, then uh, the fistula recurred and she presented many uh, ureteral, uh, urinary uh, tract infection. When she was 18 years old, a new attempt to close this fistula was made uh, with the help of a macroplastic injection, but was a, a failure. Uh, when she came to visit us, she was uh, 34 years old, and uh, she, complained, or she complained of incomplete voiding, leaks of urine, especially when the bladder was full or when she was doing an effort. Uh, she presented numerous and recurrent urinary tract infection and urethritis, especially after uh, sexual intercourse, which was uh, satisfying, uh, by the way. And uh, she was on the digestive point of view. She was clean with two peristines per week. Uh, you can see here some uh, uh, image of uh, the uh, ureteral remnant. We can see it very well uh, on this image. And also, uh, you can see that she had uh, an incomplete uh, sacrum. Uh, at the clinical examination, the entroitus was OK. Uh, she presented a hypospad urethra with prolapsus and an anal stenosis. Uh, the workup showed finally a urodynamic, which was quite normal, uh, a normal renal function. Uh, a short spinal cord on MRI that was not diagnosed when she was young, because at this time the MRI was not so acute than now, and uh, a bilateral hydrosalpunct that we can see uh, very well on this image uh, here. Um, so the, what does this story tell us? The, this tells us that also clean, cleanliness was well achieved and finally vaginal tract was satisfying. Uh, finally, this uh, sexual activity was impaired by uh, this urinary uh, tract infection that came just after uh, intersexual course. The fertility is impaired by the hydrosalpunks and she will need assisted reproductive technology uh, to uh, get children. And uh, she's uh, quite uh, uh, a knowledge of that, and she has no uh, desire for pregnancy at the moment. And so we, we can see on this uh, schema uh, that uh, the endocrine and exocrine function may impair his, uh, her fertility, but in, in this case, this is most, more the genital tract anomalies. The digestive continent is, is okay, but she presents uh, this urinary uh, problem that impair uh, her sexual activity. And we can see that uh, there is an interplay between uh, both uh, uh, problems and that can, this can impact the psychological uh, status of this patient. So uh, the multidisciplinary management is uh, uh, well demonstrated uh, is required and and uh, and uh, I think very exemplary in this uh, in this story because she need uh, now she need a, a good gynecologist, a good uh, obstetrician, a good <laughs> urologist, a good psychologist, and uh, also maybe a, a neurosurgeon and a, an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, because of uh, of the problem of the of the spine spinal cord uh, uh, and a nephrologist also because uh, we know that this patient with the multiple urinary tract infection uh, we, uh, has to be uh, have to be uh, followed by uh, a, a nephrologist. So um, this is just to illustrate the problem. 
Uh, the literature about long-term follow-up is not is not so rich, finally, but increasing. Not so rich because when we you look to PubMed and you cross long-term follow-up and anorectal malformation, you have only I will say only uh, 166 results. And when you look to uh, you cross anorectal malformation and quality of life, you have only uh, 52 results. So finally, uh, uh, we, we can feel that this thematic of uh, transition uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, is uh, at the center of our uh, preoccupation now. And this is a, 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 a good, uh, I think, webinar to, to, to talk of that. Um, we have done in France a, a, a retrospective study on of patient aged between 6 and 30 years old treated for anorectal malformation in the in the frame of our uh, network uh, coming from our reference centers and this include uh, 155 female and 212 males uh, um, 50-50 uh, low uh, uh, and high anorectal malformation. And we show as uh, many, many publications that there is a correlation between the level of the rectal blind botch and uh, voluntary bowel movements, soiling, discrimination between stool and gaze, and constipation. But uh, what uh, appears in, uh, in this study, and that is always also known in, in other uh, uh, studies in uh, is that the, the problems, especially on uh, the digestive point of view, voluntary bowel movements and soiling grains improve with age. We didn't perform um, a urology uh, a study on urological problems, and we know that unfortunately, uh, urological problems uh, does not improve uh, with age. And I just want to focus uh, on a recent uh, paper uh, uh, coming from uh, our colleague from uh, uh, Netherlands, I think. Um, it's a, a very interesting uh, proposal uh, to, uh, uh, to try to, to set up uh, a core outcome set um, that could be uh, shared by uh, all the teams uh, in charge of uh, anorectal malformation in order to reduce the heterogeneity in outcome reporting between clinical studies. Because finally, we don't have a real, very clear vision of, uh, of the, 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 the key points that should be uh, followed in the outcome. And this will uh, enhance the availability of comparable data and facilitate uh, evidence-based patient care. The, 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 the paper I cannot uh, detail because we are not so much time, it's just reporting the methodology that will be uh, set up uh, to uh, finally uh, determine uh, this uh, core outcome set. And what is interesting is that patient and also not only uh, surgeon, gastroenterologists, I mean medical doctors will be involved in this uh, study, but also uh, patient. And uh, I will be uh, very keen to see uh, the result of this, uh, uh, of this study. Let's now focus on our French history, I would say, because there are since 2004, a uh, French national where this is plain, uh, that has been uh, very uh, challenging for all rare disease patients. It started in 2004 with the first plane uh, labeling, uh, labeling uh, almost more than 130 uh, reference centers in France. Then there was a second plane that was the occasion to design uh, 23 national networks. We call that filière in France, grouping of expert centers, just like a little bit like ERN, finally. And actually, currently, we are in the third plane. Uh, that is now uh, very mature, I would say, with um, all these reference centers in France and aiming all for a diagnosis for all the patients. 
and organizing clinical pathway and long-term follow-up from birth to adulthood with molecular genetics when it, it is possible. Uh, our reference center was labelized, lab labelized um, in the 2007. And we started uh, by building a network to offer a reference um, I would say surgeon or a different medical doctor for all anorectal malformation patients in all families and all over the country. Uh, the locked, it's uh, quite obvious that the long-term follow-up depends on this network and it's a lifelong story. Transition is also challenging and we will see moreover uh, how we organize. Um, you see here the map and uh, our network with our center in Paris, and we are working with 34 collaborating center all over the country uh, in the red, uh, sorry, black cycle. This is um, the adult centers. And that is, uh, I would say a problem for us because we don't have many, many, many center, expert centers. And there is really a lack of experts for adults. Uh, not only in digestive, but also in uh, gynecology or um, urology. Um, so we, we were trying to do in doing the, our best, but we only have three centers in France for um, to refer adults. Then we uh, built uh, a network and then also organize in parallel uh, a one day what we say what we call a one day personalized care pathway called married pathway in the care since 2008 uh, it is very specific for each patient and adapted uh, for each time we see it there is a core of medical coordinator for digi digestive neurologic pediatric surgeons and we are working very closely with pediatricians, with um, one pediatrician expert for bladder exploration and another one for anorectal exploration. We're also working and we have, we are lucky in the care because we have a lot of specific experts for gastroenterologists, gynecologists, neurosurgeons, orthopedic cardiologists, and also someone uh, Dr. Shikala who is uh, formed and uh, has a consultation for sexual health. Uh, and what is also hyper important is uh, all what we call supportive care. Uh, for example, the stomatherapist is so important for us, on, not only for stomy, but also to follow uh, enema and peristine. We also have a dietitian to, to, to be sure that everything is okay about food and fibers. Um, we also have physiotherapists for perineal reeducation, very specific for children uh, since uh, they are six or seven years old, and of course, a psychologist, because as we said before, it is so important to support this patient uh, in their daily life. Uh, of course, a social worker also, but I, I would say what is maybe the most important is the coordination. Um, we have a nurse who is uh, coordinated all the, the this network with, of course, the secretary. So uh, it is a, a very important um, team. We are weekly. We have weekly meetings, and so also very important to share uh, about all the cases we see each week, and of course database, which is national database, and maybe soon a European database called Bama. So this network and this um, uh, multidisciplinary pathway was not so easy to to organize, and uh, I would say we are now around 200, 220 each year. Um, this is a, a very specific um, network and organization. Next, uh, and uh, of course, there is something very central for us to work with is the therapeutic patient education. We have a program. So, so what you want to say, uh, uh, Celia, <laughs> is that these are the, the, the funding of uh, to, to get a good uh, transition after that because the patients are, are managed 
since the beginning by a multidisciplinary team and that with this education program you will explain us this help patient to to have the the, con the better knowledge and better control of their uh, of their disease exactly it is a throughout life uh, management i would say for most of cases and it started at birth um, because there is it is a program in four four periods i would say there, there is parents at the very beginning and young parents who just have announcement and there is a, a um, a workshop specific for uh, the to, to 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 share the trauma of announcement between each other and with professional provide knowledge to better understand anatomy treatment surgery and to project in the future uh, and after there is another period for parents of three or four years old children uh, to sensibilize to difficultary hygiene um, and uh, treatment also and then a third period around 8 to, il, uh, to 12 it's very very important period because we introduce children together they have workshop workshop apart with parents in the other room it is very funny and very very um, important for them to um, get a good practices I would say for their daily life and then uh, we have adolescent which is a very challenging period for us because they don't like very much workshops, <laughs> but they like to be together. And, uh, and we are here to, 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 to talk about intimacy, autonomy, of course, and what that would be in adult uh, departments. And uh, this is uh, some pictures and uh, photo of a workshop, my first year at school, anatomy, drugs and company, and cooking workshop, fibers and emergency sign, uh, my case, my backpack, and me in the future, which is specific for adolescents. Uh, there are single uh, individual section, and you see here it was not so easy, but we, there are uh, about 200, uh, 250 patients included in the in the in this uh, in this program and in collective groups uh, they are uh, very less person and this is not so easy sometimes to organize this uh, therapeutic patient education collective group uh, because there are a lot of uh, patients included but are not a lot coming uh, in the, in in our hospital for that a lot of patients are uh, living far from Paris and during finally the containment, uh, COVID containment, we develop what we call e-therapeutic patient education. It is just like web conference, but online. And it was very, uh, very interesting and very appreciated by patients. Uh, we had 10 sessions during 2020 and 2021. And I think we will continue because for patients who are living far or are not coming in the hospital, it is very, very interesting. And, and again, uh, our feeling is that this uh, therapeutic education is quite key to, uh, to make people uh, more, uh, I will say, adherent uh, to uh, the follow-up uh, when they are uh, young adults or adults because since their uh, childhood, they have been educated like that. So it's, they are living with that much more comfort comfortably. And this is, that's why it seems a bit strange that we speak of that because we are, we are uh, uh, the, the webinar is on, on uh, long -term transition and yeah, long term. Yeah, but, that. but the idea is that like for any child, the, the education time is very important for the adulthood period. So, uh, and when we began with the, with the center, at the beginning, we have m much more difficulty because these patients, we, we, they come up very old and we didn't have them when they were young and it was much more difficult than now. You, you agree with that? Yes, completely. Um, it, it is, uh, th this therapeutic patient education program is uh, an important lever for long-term monitoring and maintaining good practices 
even if families uh, are not at the, uh, aware of it uh, uh, at the very beginning, we, we, we are working and working each time we see each other because it is um, uh, the guarantee, I would say, for a, a, a well transition okay. and a well, and um, I would say happy transfer. Happy transfer. <laughs> okay. So just, uh, just to say that in, to, to, to uh, confirm patients' empowerment, we, we built an, an, um, an app for mobile, uh, mobile app, uh, which is unfortunately only in French for, for the moment, but uh, it, it, it helped them to um, 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 deliver. Uh, they deliver each day, sorry, uh, what they are doing for urine and, and stools. And uh, as medical doctor, you can see directly or in consultation what they have recorded and uh, it is very very um, important for empowerment uh, for patients and a very very nice tool for them we hope to to make the translation yes, in english in soon. english soon so of course uh, we have a transition program uh, since 2010 uh, working with as i said before adult surgeons adult gastroenterologists and I think it's maybe more important gastroenterologists than surgeons at the age when we are in transition and before transfer of, of the file, urologists and also very very important fertility program because most of them as we say uh, as we see for the girl but also for male it is a, a very big, big point and, and, and sometimes an issue um, and gynecologists, of course. And we also have, thanks to our other reference center in France, cardiologists, orthopedics, nephrologists, neurosurgeons, we need to. And, but as I said, it's also so difficult to find experts in different fields in France. Um, as a network, ne Neurosphinx network, uh, MAREP is included in North France and we are both with Sabine coordinating this national network. We are also a leader of the Inter-Networks Transition Group since 2016 and we have a dedicated um, website. There is, uh, th there are in France 23 uh, networks like that and 21 of them are um, included in this specific group, which is very interesting because we have a look and an overview of what the others are doing. And it's very interesting and, and we share tools and, um, and uh, training and information as, we, as you see in the other slides. Um, we, we, we have a podcast, a first season called Franchir, which means cross. We also have a mobile app specific for teenagers and transition, which is also in French. And we share also tools and therapeutic education programs. We also have a parents uh, committee with, uh, for the moment, 10 parents, which is very important because sometimes we forget them, I think, when transition occurs and parents sometimes feel so alone with their teenagers and after the young adults. And uh, it is a very important um, group. Um, and we, we focus uh, finally with this group with compa information campaigns. Uh, we have the chance in France to have also platform dedicated to transition. Uh, in uh, Necker, it, it is called La Suite, the following, but there are 12 in France, 11 other platforms in France, and it is uh, uh, very helpful for medical doctors, but also for caregivers in general, for orientation, information, and networking um, for teenagers. And uh, we are organizing um, soon in the um, uh, 22 of June, um, a second um, Congress, uh, just only on transition in rare disease, uh, um, which it will be in France. So maybe we can summarize all we said uh, after this long follow-up 
um, to, to, to summarize in this, uh, in this picture that all skills must fit together autonomy, sexuality, compliance, treatment, scholarity, professionalization, follow-up, life projects, etc. And I think it is a very good summarize uh, of what should be in the in ideal world uh, before transfer, because transfer is still very challenging, I think, for all of our patients. Um, because we lack, as we said, of uh, experts for adults in our specific pathology and anorectal malformation in particular. Um, but we can help, we can hope that with all the work that is done uh, in the in the frame of this uh, network that are set up in France around some thematic because this uh, cardiology and rectal malformation or, or well, our our network is on continent problem coming from many other diseases. I mean, there are uh, in this network uh, patient with spina bifida, for example, uh, and, and and we can hope that with all this work, uh, we can have uh, adults uh, specialists that will be interested uh, and involved in the care of this patient because this is really a problem. And we saw that we co all collect from other uh, countries have the chance to have adults I involved in, in, that, uh, in that specific care. Yes, and I think as we have started um, in 2008, now we will have soon young adults that will be aware, I would say, of what we are doing and maybe will be um, more happy to contribute uh, to what uh, to what we are, we are building. And we have uh, also the chance since 2020 uh, to, to, to work with a, a patient's association called Tintamar. And it's a chance because uh, there are adults that are coming now to see us and to, to contribute and to help us to, to, to inform and to, to work on this network and information uh, campaigns, I would say. So take home messages. So as you see, we have seen uh, uh, I, uh, anorectal malformation follow up is a lifelong journey. Uh, I think the importance of a multidisciplinary team to manage this patient uh, since the beginning is very important as I in any other, uh, I will say, pediatric congenital anomaly. Uh, and. Uh, it is very important to give a real and comprehensive vision of the pathology and a good lifestyle habits from the start. That, that's why we, we insist on the, 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 the period during childhood, because this, this will build the good basis for a good transition and a good transfer. Because transition is mandatory, yes, but transfer is challenging. It's challenging on the side of the doctors, it's challenging on the side of the patients and their families because they have to change uh, from a side where they were quite grown up to another uh, to another side. And uh, we, we hope that this will improve uh, with all this work that has that is done, especially um, through uh, the, rare, the, the third rare disease plan. And uh, again, therapeutic patient education is key to develop auto-determination and empowerment. And uh, again, we, we want to thank all our colleagues uh, that work with us in NECER, uh, the team of Neuroscience, this uh, network uh, on uh, continent problem and neurosphinx. This is a, a gathering of a, a patient with a, a dysraphism, a patient with a urological uh, yes. uh, malformation and anorectal malformation. And uh, the, the, our team from uh, our reference center on anorectal malformation and, and also and and also, and and also uh, the association of uh, patients and families Tintamar, we are very uh, happy to have this uh, association because for many years we were uh, very jealous of uh, Italian <laughs> and uh, <laughs> other uh, uh, countries in Europe that had uh, their association and not in France. Now it's done. Thank you very much for attention.
Any question? <laughs> bye bye. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank the organization for the opportunity to tell something about our follow up program. My name is Hanneke Eiselstein, and I will uh, do this presentation together with Irene Skokker, who is working as a practice research nurse in the department, especially in the care for patients with colorectal malformations. We have no conflicts of interest to report. First, I would like to start with a short history uh, regarding the long-term follow-up program that we developed uh, almost 25 years ago in our hospital and Department of Pediatric Surgery. Uh, then I will show you some of the results of the evaluations in the colorectal malformations uh, patient groups. Uh, finally, some other research material which have all contributed to the new follow-up program that's currently being applied to our patients. And at that time, Irene will take over and uh, explain about what we are actually doing now in the long-term follow-up of our patients and uh, things that we would like to do in the future. As already said, we have a follow-up program established in 1999 for all children with uh, anatomical congenital malformations in the Department of Pediatric Surgery, so CDH, esophageal atresia, intestinal atresia, and colorectal malformations. From beginning onwards, uh, we established this as a longitudinal follow-up program that was standardized for the assessment ages and for the instruments that were being used. It has always been uh, applied as an interdisciplinary uh, follow-up program, initially with pediatrician and psychology involved, later on uh, pediatric surgeon, physical therapists, and uh, other disciplines if needed. It is considered in our hospital a standard of care, and it should also be a guarantee for an appropriate transition into adolescence and adulthood. The need for interdisciplinary care is shown in this cartoon here. Instead of just running off with uh, the organ you are interested in, it is important to use a holistic approach for the care of these patients, and this is especially also applicable for the children with colorectal malformations. The follow-up schedule uh, is shown here, the initial follow-up schedule that we used 25 years ago, with assessments at uh, 6, 12, and 24 months after birth, and at, uh, depending on the school pro uh, program in the Netherlands, at 5, 8, 12, and 18 years. And this has been slightly modified based on our experience. So the uh, assessment at 24, age, 24 months of age was uh, put to 30 months, uh, for speech-language development, and uh, there was another meeting scheduled, an outpatient clinic visit at 14 years. And for healthcare insurance reasons, our final visit before transition to adult care specialist is at 17. It is important to consider the clinical data that you have uh, during the initial hospitalization, the surgery, and everything that happens, and combine this with the data that you obtain as a kind of outcome research from the outpatient clinic for all the assessments that you perform. And by evaluating these data together, uh, you can uh, improve care, which will, uh, of course, change your clinical data again, and you might develop interventions that are tailor-made based, based on the data that you have evaluated. Many of the studies of the first years in our long-term follow-up program have been described in the PhD thesis by Desiree van de Bondel. She defended her thesis in 2015, and I would like to share a few of the results described in her thesis. First, I would like to show you a little bit about growth in anorectal malformation patients. Here you see the longitudinal growth data from six months until five years of age. Uh, height is indicated as circles, weight for height indicated as squares, and data are shown as standard deviation scores or z-scores with a population mean of zero. As you can see, children with comorbidity have more growth problems in the long run than those without comorbidity. And you can also see that height for age is more, uh, much more impaired than weight for age, weight for height, which might 
indicate that children with uh, high problems have uh, chronic malnutrition and you could speculate that there are some causes like chronic constipation, uh, feeding difficulties that might contribute to this uh, phenomenon. Another thing that we looked into is the neurodevelopment of these children. For the first two years, we used the Bailey skills of uh, motor of development, and we have the mental developmental index scale, which is shown in circles here, and the psychomotor developmental scale for uh, in, in squares. The, F, the population mean is 100, so the standard deviation of 15. And as you can see, uh, for all ages, the mental developmental index for anorectal malformations patients within the first two years of life is normal, whereas the psychomotor developmental index is uh, below normal and probably even deteriorates within the first two years. What happens to these children when they go to school? Some of the results are shown in this study by Desiree from the anorectal malformation patients and the Hirschsprung disease patients. When we look into school performance, we see that about 50% of children attend regular education. And uh, about 40% or 30% needs extra help at school, and special education is applied in 13 and 25% uh, respectively. If you compare these to the data from the healthy Dutch children in the Netherlands at the time that this paper was published, which was published in 2016, special education was attended by about 5% of the children and regular education with help was applied in about 20%. So more children with colorectal malformations need extra help to keep up at the real career school program or they have to attend uh, special education. This is irrespective of their IQ. They don't have a, a cognitive uh, impairment uh, reflected in the low IQ because the overall IQ is close to the population mean of 100 for both groups. As you can see, when you look into the data of verbal and performal IQ, you see that especially in the anorectal malformation patients, the verbal IQ is overall somewhat higher than the performal IQ. Though this is not uh, clinically significant, uh, as such considered by the psychologist, uh, you might speculate whether these uh, findings reflect uh, developmental problems in the right hemisphere, which is, for instance, seen in uh, children with attachment disorders. We not only looked into the children, but they also performed a study in adults born with anorectal malformations and Hirschsprung disease. And uh, she uh, sent out a survey to all the patients that were, uh, could recruit from two different hospitals in the Netherlands, the Rappazum in Nijmegen and our hospital in Rotterdam. And about 30% of patients uh, were, uh, joined this study. The questionnaires that we used were uh, uh, validated uh, surveys with normative data for the Netherlands, and we found that for the uh, men, about uh, 11 to 16 percent of the patients had erectile dysfunction at a median age around 30 years. In the females, uh, we saw that uh, even 50 percent of women reported uh, to have sexual dysfunction and 20 to or 38 percent had sexual distress. Probably even more informative were the answers to the uh, additional standardized questions that we uh, added to this study. In the top panel you see the results of the anorectal malformation patients, in the lower panel you see the Hirschsprung disease patients and when we asked them whether the doctor ever discussed sexual issues related to the condition, this was answered positively by less than 10% in both groups. Whereas more than 50 or even more than 60% would have loved to get more information. And also quite striking, I think, is that uh, about 50% of the patients would be willing to think along with us how to educate young people with a condition uh, like yours. So this 
results, and especially those standardized questions, prompted us to continue with this project. And what we did, we uh, set up a consortium uh, with uh, the different university hospitals in the Netherlands. We involved uh, different uh, specialists involved in care, like pediatric surgeons, urologists, psychologists, um, uh, practice nurses, uh, but also involved uh, an institution in the Netherlands, Athena Institute, that is specialized to develop empowering uh, tools for patients and uh, asking questions by focus groups, etc. This has led to uh, the development of a website, um, which is informative not only for, uh, for the uh, professionals, but also for the patients themselves. Which leads to the fact that I just forgot to tell you that, of course, patient support groups were uh, heavily involved in this project. So both for the anorectal malformations and the Hirschsprung disease, uh, they were involved and contributed to uh, the web informative website that they developed. So this website is a development of a tool to address the sexual health in colorectal malformations informative. It is currently available both in Dutch and in English, uh, and it will be launched soon on the Ernica website. And as soon as this, uh, as this is available, we will share the link within both ERNs. Having said all this, I hope that I got you a little impression of what we did over the past years and how this continued uh, in the current follow-up program that will be uh, presented by Erin. Thank you, Annika. So what are we doing now? We make a new follow-up uh, line, like you see here, and our fixed point where we see the patients. It's a lot of info. Little, so it's a lot of information. So I don't walk you through this, but you, like you can see, it's fixed moments where the patient is coming. And from the research before, we add a couple of moments in this program. We have a colorectal team with two surgeons, Dr. Schloos and Dr. Mielsa. We have a psychologist, uh, the cognitive behavior therapist, two stoma nurses, and myself as a nurse practitioner. One moment that we add on the follow-up is an extra point on three and a half year age for the potty training. At two years of age, there was already a moment that a patient is coming, but we add a cognitive behavior therapist on this moment. To give a lot of information to the parents, we see a lot of stress by parents uh, on this moment. They feel a little bit pressure. My child has to be continent, has to be clean. And also the surrounding is giving a lot of pressure for the patient because on the age of four, they have to be clean before they go to school. So a cognitive behavior therapist has time to give a lot of information and reduce the stress with people. They give information about the correct position and we hope to make the subject a little bit smaller. So like potty training is not all day in the house. We make it a little bit smaller. And then on the age of three and a half, we see the people back and we see if they already are continent. Are they not? Then we see what are we going to do in the last half year before they go to school? Or do we have to start with bowel irrigation? And a favorite point of mine is the transition of care unit. We start at 12, 14, and 17 or 18 with fixed points, and on the 18 they go to the adult care. They will see uh, me as a nurse practitioner on that uh, part. You have to give information about the disease. What you see is that a lot of people don't know exactly what they have. We give a lot of information to the parents when they are born, but give patient to the give information to the patient that never happened. So what is important on the age of 12 is give information what kind of disease do they have, if they other things like the factorial screening. And if you know what you have, you can recognize alarm signals. And if you know alarm signals, you can take care for yourself. Other things that are changing is the right uh, you have to be informed in everything. And also the insurance is changing. At the age of 18, you have to pay for a lot of things for yourself. 
and also sometimes you cannot go to a uh, uh, university hospital so you have to know that so you have to choose right self-management is very important sometimes you have to give yourself irrigation are you already doing that yourself or have to say your mother that every day to you that you have to do it so you have to learn how to do it yourself how to order your medication um, how to care for yourself and if you know what kind of disease you have and you know how to handle yourself it's more confidence it gives you confidence and sometimes we see problems with the confidence can you accept your illness and if not we ask if there are problems with that, we can send them to a psychologist who is in our team. And then, like you heard already from Hanneke, it's very important to talk about sexuality. So I sit with the patients alone, not always on the age of 12, but mostly on the age of 14, and I send the parents away. I'm not disgusted with the patients, I send them away because I don't want any conflicts with the parents uh, if the uh, patient themselves send them away. And then uh, you are going to talk about, uh, can you talk about your disease? If you have a partner, can you talk about it? Uh, if you are continent, do you can sleep with anyone or uh, other things they want to discuss? I have a psychologist, a gynecologist, a urologist, uh, and a sexualist needed um, if we have more problems. And of course, I give the children and the young adults the website that Tonic Adjustment. And never forget the role of parents, because they are there from the from the beginning and they are care caregivers. So they have a very important role, but they have to learn how to step back and see how their ch child is moving. Uh, they have to support them with the hands on the back. And sometimes that's very difficult. So don't forget to give the parents information about the step. They are part of the transition. So you have to know that. Because there are difficult topics in the transition of care. The Ernica is make, uh, has just made three whiteboard videos. Uh, one about parent and child interaction. That's just what we talk about. Don't forget the parents. And the alcohol and smoking and the sexuality. You can find them on the Ernica YouTube channel. And because of transition of care is just a very hard topic and it's very popular on this moment because I know that Eurogen and Ernica both are very busy with the transition of care. Um, and also the Erasmus MC is busy to make a transition of care problem. Uh, like you see here, um, this is a blueprint of the transition of care because transition is not only for the endorectal malformation, it's for a lot of diseases. So you can find it from scratch and start over again and over again. But if you work together, you can make a blueprint for all the diseases, diseases and then specialize it for malformation. And then they turn 18 and then, like you still, uh, we have a standard interval for the children, but at the adult side, they have to make our, their self their appointment. Um, so they have to know what kind of alarm system they have to make uh, their own appointment. And we have here in the Erasmus MC a pediatric surgeon who's sitting on the adult side to see the anorectal malformation patients. And Ten times a year, he's sitting there, but it's not well used yet. But we are hoping to get more in the future. So the take home message is be aware of the potty training. It's a stressful period of the patients, uh, especially to the parents. Uh, addiction to transition of care, work on knowledge and self-management, work on confidence, talk about sexuality. Don't forget the parents. And if you have to start with transition, create a universal transition plan. Future perspective. We want to focus on trauma with patient and child interaction in early years. And we want to evaluate the useful of transition and uh, talking about sexuality, what we now are doing. 
thank you for your attention and we are welcome to for questions. Okay, this is probably which adult specialists take care of adult patients with ARM. Probably Irene would be the best to answer this uh, because she is involved in the transition now. Can you repeat the question, Hanneke? Sorry, I didn't hear you very good. Which adult specialists take care of adult patients with ARM? Uh, we have in the adult clinic, we have Dr. Sloot, so he's a children surgeon, but also an adult surgeon. Uh, and he is doing the adult clinic. But he built a network of uh, persons, uh, urologists, gynecologists, and other specialists uh, around him who are on the adult side. So it's a it's a, a children's surgeon, but he's sitting at the adult side because it's hard to find someone who is really into anorectal malformation and really interesting because. Um, a surgeon is not going to, they don't have a lot of operation on the adult period. Um, so it's hard to find someone who is really interesting. I hope that answers the question. Okay, yeah, thank you, Irina. I think just saying, um, I've got a message from Pim actually, he's uh, joined, is, is in here, um, saying he cannot hear. Um, so I don't know if you can hear me, Pim, but uh, I'd say to everybody, I didn't mean to say this at the start, apologies. If you have problems with the audio uh, or seeing uh, slides or anything, best thing is to, to leave and rejoin. That would hopefully usually solves uh, most problems for people, for attendees. Um, so, but I will also say that we're recording this. I can hear it, the audio has been recorded on there. So we will, once it's all pieced together, there will be an entire recording with all the audio and everything on it. So people will be able to watch it back uh, at some point soon. Um, we've got a few other uh, questions from Dalia Amanoff that's come through. Um, so I'm not sure who's is best for. Sorry, <laughs> apologies. So I'm going to send it to uh, you, Hanneke, and if you decide who uh, is best to answer this. Let me see. Uh, because I only still see one question. Okay, I'm sent. You, you can pop that box out. If you click the little grey uh, arrow to the right-hand side of it, it will pop it out into a larger box. Wait a minute. Okay, yes. Uh, the question is, what happens when a doctor leaves? Do you have a replacement policy? Uh, I think, yes, in general, uh, in the outpatient clinic, and it's not only for the pediatric surgeons, but also for all other staff members involved uh, for the whole uh, long-term follow-up clinic, if uh, colleagues uh, change their jobs, they are being replaced. And also, uh, for instance, with physical therapists, uh, if they leave, we try to get another dedicated uh, physical therapist who will get experience uh, in the same field. So. You're not having uh, every another week another person taking care of your patients, but we work with a dedicated team with uh, paramedical and medical staff uh, that is being replaced if necessary. Okay, thank you. And it also was meant as uh, replacement for uh, an adult specialist. Well. As Irene already explained to us, we are very lucky that uh, the pediatric surgeon, Pim Sloats, uh, has a lot of experience in taking care of the uh, adult patients as well. So uh, he has uh, connections with many uh, other colleagues, but he is the uh, main person to see these patients uh, also as adults. So we can continue uh, and, and guarantee uh, proper uh, care also in adulthood. Okay, um, any other questions, anybody, please, if you put them in now, I will give it another minute, um, just while we're waiting. Um, um, I will it was about, I kind of already explained, I guess, a lot of this, that the, this session is recorded, so we'll piece it together. So it won't be a recording, set, a link sent out tomorrow, we'll wait until we've got the whole thing recorded again and put together, and then I'll send it out, hopefully, sometime next week, maybe all the week after, we're not sure how, depends how quickly we can facilitate that. Um, uh, please check our website for future uh, sessions. We've got a little bit of a gap at the moment over the next few weeks. I think people are very 
are basically a lot of people away on holiday. Um, so we've got a few sessions coming up again in before the summer. Um, so they are listed on the website and Ernica will um, uh, obviously doing these in social with Ernica. I think we've got another uh, joint one coming up. But that's probably the next one is another ARM webinar on the 10th of May, I believe, um, which will be led by Ernica, that one. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much all I say. We've got another question come through actually. So I'll send that on to you. Uh, this, is, this mentions pediatric surgeons, so I'm going to send it to you, Hannah, for this one. So uh, hopefully that's come through. Okay. Uh, some someone is asking of their, what happens in other hospitals, also with respect to the uh, pediatric surgeons. I'm not sure. Quite sure what's meant by this question. Probably, Irene, you you know what other centers are doing. Yeah, uh, I know that Nijmegen does have a, a surgeon at the adult side who is interesting in name in uh, the adult and rectal malformation patients. But yeah, it's hard to uh, to say. I don't know that for all the hospitals in Holland. In Holland. So we do it like this way, and I know that all the hospitals, and also in Europe, because we talk about that in Ernica, that a lot of people have trouble to find someone at the adult side. Because do you want a surgeon or do you want another doctor to care for these patients? So it's a hard topic. Yes, it might be good to mention that it is not only difficult for uh, the pediatric surgeons uh, for anorectal malformations or uh, Hirschsprung disease, but we uh, have also the same kind of problems uh, for other uh, congenital anomalies like esophageal atresia and uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And now we are very lucky to have uh, dedicated outpatient clinics in the adult hospital for uh, those diseases. but it took us a long time uh, to get to know. And I have the experience also, for instance, with the Sovetiotresia, that we had uh, someone to uh, gastroenterologist looking at uh, uh, Sovetiotresia patients, and it worked out that he just disappeared to another hospital and we were not even notified. So after uh, some of the referrals, they were never answered properly, uh, we found out. and. Uh, it took us a lot of time and uh, a lot of uh, patience to uh, look in, go into the adult hospital and find dedicated colleagues. And uh, we were very lucky to manage uh, for the other diseases and lucky that we have a pediatric surgeon working in the adult hospital. But uh, I think this is one of the most challenging uh, things that we are now facing for all the congenital anomalies. Uh, to transfer them properly and to make sure that they're being taken care of properly in the long term. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, so Katrin says thank you for that answer. So I think that answered the question. Um, we don't have any other questions come in. So um, if people want to put them in quickly, they can while well, I just maybe start finishing off. Um, so um thank you to everybody who uh, has joined the webinar today uh, thank you for attending as usual and thanks most of all to our presenters i know things haven't worked out perfectly but um, thank you to them for taking their time for all of this and we will get everything sorted um so thank you to celia sabine hanika and irena um and i hope everyone has a good evening if you have any think of any questions afterwards anybody please send them on email to some email to me as well i will pass them on and um any comments as well, please pass them on. Um, you will get a survey as well, the, all the attendees after this. So if you can fill that in, um, that would be helpful. I know things haven't really been perfect today, but um, I think more around kind of the more what you have seen, uh, if you could comment on that, that would be great. It's also useful and the format of the, the webinars, things like that. Um, okay, so thank you everybody. And thank you for taking the time to the presenters again uh, and uh, for doing this. And I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.